Thank you so much for choosing Cast TV. We appreciate you. Welcome to the Conservation Conversation. My name is Chemtai Kirui. It's always a pleasure to have you join us. I'm really excited about the conversation that you're going to have here today because we're going to talk about rabies and how this disease can be prevented if we take measures. I'm not alone in studio. In a short minute, I'm going to introduce the guest that I have here with me. She is the director from the Action for Protection of Animals Africa. Her name is Dr. Kavosa Mdoga. Dr. Kavosa is a public health expert. She's also a trained veterinary doctor, and she's been in the front line of consulting and developing the issue of how we as a nation and Africa at large can fight the uh, the effect of rabies uh, transmission. And also she's been uh, in the front lines working with uh, organizations such as World Health Organization and Pan-African Rabies Control Network Partnership in Africa to ensure that they come up with the best uh, method forward of us to fight this issue of rabies. So without much ado, let me welcome Dr. Arikwa Studio. Karibu sana, Dr. Thank Kamosa. You, <laughs> Such a pleasure for you to join us. I really appreciate your time. I've mentioned just a little bit of what you've done. So probably for a minute you can tell us what the organization does. Okay, Action for Protection of Animals Africa is a new baby. It's an offshoot of uh, World Animal Protection which is based in, the head office is based in Kenya, but they work within Africa. So our main areas we have is animals in disasters. So my colleague, she's an expert in disasters. So she works in the area of policy making, um, working with communities, and then working with governments. As you know, whenever we have disasters before, everyone would go and save the human being. But unfortunately, um, when a disaster happens, before people settle down, before people can plant crops and put up, put up houses, their first source of food or income or exchange is usually the animals. So now that's a time people do realize when you have a disaster, you have to save the livestock <laughs> of the people yeah. that are there. Yeah. If it's in urban centers, you need to save the cats and the dogs because if you don't save the cats and the dogs and left to go wild, then you have a population and management problem and a disease outbreak problem. Apart from that is not only disasters in that area where you come in and mitigate during disasters, but you can also mit mitigate before disasters. So now like in Kenya, the University of Nairobi has got what we call a Veru team. And uh, students are taught, taught in Veru. And in those teams, when they go out in the countries where they work, they help counties prepare pre-disasters. So you see there are some counties where when the drought has happened in Kenya and all these things that have happened and floods, some are not having much issues because within the county system they already put what disaster risk reduction measures. And the other one, as I said, is working with animals in the wild. And for us, our area of animals in the wild is where the wildlife intermingle in the areas of disasters and in the areas with companion animals. So it's in the One Health zoonotic cycle. Because in, in Africa, we live either at the edges or with and within our wild areas and our wildlife. So now apart from that, I said we work in the One Health area. So now One Health area is, is pretty based. <laughs> it's, it's where you work with One Health teams globally. So like for us, we would, we'd, we would represent the, health, the vet side of the One Health. And then last but not least is my area, which is the companion animals. Um, companion animals say the dogs and cats, and then you have donkeys. But donkeys is so specialized, we have separate organizations that just do donkeys alone. It's a very, very specialized animal. <laughs> So now for us, as the area we are seeing is we mostly do it dogs and cats. And in the area we are doing is we work in dog population management. Because when it comes to dogs, it's not about rabies. When you talk about dog population management, it is not only about um, making sure dogs do not produce babies. There is a lot. There's responsible dog ownership. For county level, there's registration. There's provision of health care. People understanding how to provide the five freedoms, proper food, proper housing, for, for the dog and, and then understanding the human dog interactions and human cat interactions uh, to enable a better environment and a better health status across <laughs> in, in a household status. Yeah. Probably for someone who's watching at home and they don't really understand the in-depth of rabies or the zoonosis disease, could you just for a minute explain how it, it works? So rabies is a disease caused by a virus. Yeah, I'll not go into the nitty gritty details of the virus. <laughs> but it affects warm-blooded animals. So now, 
Rabies is called kicha chaumbwa in Kiswahili, and in very many dialects, it's, it's, it has a connotation of being given, being spread by the dog. And that's because it's, the dog is a main vector, but it affects all mammals, which includes humans, your cows, your goats, and wildlife. So for, very, for a very long time, in the early 80s, and the early 70s and 80s, rabies had literally been almost controlled in Africa. As you notice in some places in the West, and this is the dog mediated because there's a rabies there's a rabies in bats, but that is slightly different on how it works and how it's mediated, and that's mostly seen in Latin America. So in Africa at least we just have the dog one we have to manage. And then the, in North America and uh, Western Europe they have subvariants that are wildlife ones, but they're not that bad because they're close to the dog ones so they can be handled. So now what happened is as you know, towards the late eighties and nineties, IMF brought this thing called SAPS. And what SAPS did is that some government provided services were removed from government and taken to private. Mm -hmm. So in Africa, what happened is that there was even a time in Kenya, East Africa, Tanzania, rabies, if you had a case, it was very rare. And when SAPS came and that was removed from the government sector, then all of a sudden, because people couldn't afford the private sector, this disease now spread. And right now it's come to a point where now Europe and America that thought they were free, they now, people are coming to Africa seeing a sweet dog and going with it, and they're like, they did not know that the animal has rabies. Uh, they come to visit, they get bitten, someone dies. So now it has become an urgent disease. So it's what World Health have caused in the SDGs, neglected tropical diseases that they are targeted to remove. And the funny thing is, rabies has a vaccine that's almost over 130 years old because it was in fact one of the first diseases where a vaccine a working vaccine was produced and it's manufactured around the world it's easy to manufacture and uh, to bring on ground so the question is why is there a disease that is 100 percent preventable but 100 percent fatal and is one of the diseases that has had a vaccine available to prevent it or to stop it is now emerging and now spreading again. That is why now in 2014, the World Health Association, which is the umbrella body of the One Health um, Drive globally, came together and 2015 rabies became one of the first neglected tropical diseases where by 2030, they want to at least have finished the transmission in humans. Then from 2030 onwards now to see how we can end the transmission and eradicate it in dogs. Mm -hmm. I think I'll ask you the question, why is it that right now we're seeing the surgence of this rabies? What is it that we are not doing and we should be doing? First of all, I'd say the first point of resurgence is one lack of knowledge. Yes, because I remember in the, in the 70s and 80s when I was small, before city council would go around, give the message about rabies, and then when rabies time came, you'd go and have your dog vaccinated. After that period, they would come checking. So there was that thing of community and, and, and government training and, and teaching on rabies. Right now, people up country will go and they know there's the rabies, but most of them don't know how to stop or protect it and what to do. So right now, there's a knowledge gap that has been created on what people, their knowledge on rabies, how to prevent it, or should you get bitten, or should someone get bitten, what to do and where to go and what stops it. So now there is that big knowledge gap. Mm -hmm. Two, as I said, after the SAPs happened, most governments in Africa have, re have removed the amount of money that they put either on the veterinary side or the human side for rabies. So what is there can't really do much. And in most countries where something is happening, it's because private NGOs and organizations have come in to bridge the gaps. And the problem is because an NGO can only work in a small area, you find there are small pockets where things are okay, but then there are gaps in between. On a wider area, when you're talking about con continents, is that, um, but it's something that is happening now, is now cross-boundary communications. Because you know dogs, the dog in Kajado is going to be in Arusha within a week's time and then back again. <laughs> Kajado. Yeah, and especially in Kenya, in Africa, we have pastoral areas. Dogs move with the pastoralists, so it's a transboundary disease. Mm -hmm. So now, if when there are outbreaks or if carrying vaccinations is not coordinated, because if our goats, our cows are going to Uganda, when they cross, on the other side, there's a Ugandan um, veterinary officer 
checking the vaccination records, if at all, for brucella, foot and mouth disease. But we have not integrated, I think we've thrown the back of our hands, but they are not checking the dog which is going across. Mm -hmm. So now, as I said, that is now coming together because IGAD and EAC, with the help of AU IBA, are now bringing transboundary um, disease notification and coordination between African countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, so now, as I said, basically those are the things, government investment, knowledge, and now that lack of transboundary coordination amongst countries. Yeah. Public veterinarians are so few. Uh, public veterinarians are more and public veterinarians are so few. So now if the, government, public, if the government wants to work with only their veterinarians, them trying to get these programs across in an area, it wouldn't be that easy because of the the human resource numbers mm -hmm. but as we have seen it's a place where now public and private at county level have to come together and move and some counties like Makweni and then we have even like Kipia County have actually come together and I think Nyeri are the next ones who are doing it coming together and integrating the public and private uh, veterinary systems because yeah. that's the only way yeah, to, to go about, <laughs> you can, you can yeah. go about it the dog is a member, as, and by the way, very so funny. If you go up country, you think people don't understand them, and you sit down with them, they realize, oops, the dog is a member <laughs> of the, the family. family. Yeah. <laughs> so now, in, in rural areas, you can't stop dogs from wandering. Dogs are social animals, so they socialize. And there's nothing wrong with them socializing. You, you can't stop it, and there's nothing wrong with them socializing. But then the point is, is um, what we call responsible dog ownership where people have to be done, given the knowledge on how to train your dog. Because if that dog is trained to have manners, if that dog is well fed, because most people do not understand, once a dog is full, many a times it will just go so far to meet its neighbor friend, after that it will come home. Many a times when dogs wander very far is because they're not being fed at home, and so they're going to look for food. So once a dog is well fed, then that's okay. Then if you keep your medical records for your dogs, Apart from that is to help people understand um, dog psychology. So now Kenya has a national rabies elimination strategy and one of those is education. So in the two counties where the pilot has been done, Makweni and Siaya, that was part of the program. So one part of the prog program was educating teachers to be trainer of trainers, to train other teachers and then the teachers training children in school on how to feed a dog, how to make sure it's, 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 well, it's cared for, um, that it needs vaccinations, and especially one other thing is dog bite prevention, because most people don't understand, almost 90% of dog bites are actually preventable. It's just that we don't understand mm. <laughs> how they do that. Yeah. And in all these cases, in both Sida and Makweni, when these teachers started te teaching the students, and the students um, learned this thing, dog bite cases not only in children but adults because you know when a child goes home they say teacher lisema teacher lisema and you have yeah. to listen to what yes. teacher said <laughs> lisema, yes. dog bite cases just dropped if you actually look at hospital bite by bite, bite cases most of them happen during the mating season because dogs actually work differently or when somebody goes to a dog when they have just given birth and have puppies or when a dog has found a source of food and they're really hungry so people get to understand this thing. So now there are the areas that in both counties, they trained community workers. So now not only the veterinary community workers, but in most counties, the health community workers are majority. So now they had the training to health community workers about rabies, responsible dog ownership. Mm -hmm. You know, the first time it was like, why are you taking human community workers? But it, it, it understood. So when you're going to tell somebody to take your child for polio and because of X, Y, Z and wash your hands, then, oh, have you remembered to take the dog because it's X, Y, Z, so, or, yeah. and if you don't, this will happen. Mm. So that is the area where, where, where a lot of work, work has, has, has been done in, in responsible dog ownership. Mm -hmm. Another area is uh, where the country is going right now is that people, counties now, some of them are underway in making sure people register their dogs. So I think in the next couple of years, we'll see where now everyone who owns a dog um, will register your dog and if your dog does XYZ then you know you're gonna pay a fine of this mm -hmm. that and how mm -hmm. and then now also counties um, improving and private vets improving facilities where if somebody has a female dog or a male dog and they don't want them to produce what to do because most people don't understand that a dog doesn't have to have babies every month when you sit down and you go to the community and you sit down in those community barazas and you explain guys are like ah 
ah, you mean I didn't know we can do this. <laughs> So that is that is that 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 is a system as where you're going. And what you had alluded to area is that like you see, public health is to be veterinary public health and human public health. But right now universities and colleges are merging the public health degree to cover both sectors plus environment. Because what what, what has been happening, as you said, is that the human science since rabies during the work that was done in 70s, 80s and globally went down, it stopped being like a priority disease being trained on the human, human side. Mm -hmm. So now there is that gap. But as I said, the counties that have done the pilots, the medics were brought in and that gap, you know, the small training sessions that were brought in and filled in and what to do and how to do it came in. Okay. And then also there is a lack of uh, provision of vaccines because one people assume if the dog was not was not looking mad if i did not have a cat when he bit me i do not have rabies but also the cost is very high mm -hmm. so many people will skive going to get injected because they can't afford and if i'm not dead in the next one month i do not have it but that's mm -hmm. a lie because sometimes rabies can take <laughs> quite a bit of oh. time so now even provision at government hospitals and private hospitals uh, private private uh, chemists is a bit low because they don't want to stock this drug that may expire and there's not that much. So now the provision or availability of the human vaccine most is a factor of people's lack of knowledge and also cost. But some counties now, as I said, are bridging that cost, making the human vaccine uh, cheaper. So if somebody's bitter, that they understand that it's cheaper, they know they can go. And, and get vaccinated at a cheaper price. Okay. Apart from that is from the two pilots, there's this thing called dog bite management and dog bite centers, which is now being, the, the first two pilot areas is going to expand. So now people are trained how to understand when you're bitten, if you see A, B, C, D, do I need to take all seven? Or is my bill cut to only one, two, three doses. Okay. So it's made cheaper and more available and more knowledge. But I said that area is basically, as I said, the battle will be won by knowledge. 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 Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> more training, really. Yeah. What, what, what is the frequency of dog vaccination, the simplest uh, frequency that someone who owns a dog should? The simplest vaccination is when you get a puppy. It needs, a part, there's a whole regime of vaccinations, but I'll break out rabies. Um, Depending on the dog, small and medium breeds, uh, they get um, twice when they are puppy. They are, there's a schedule. Okay. So they, they need to get two vaccinations for their first year of life, then after that yearly. Larger breeds may need three vaccinations and then that yearly. So every dog in Kenya is actually supposed to be vaccinated against rabies okay. yearly. And these are available even in the rural areas? Oh yes, you'll find rabies vaccinations av available within agrovets or within vet with veterinarians. Okay. I think what I've gotten from you, Dr. Ray, from all the conversation is that this is not a one sector approach. You've mentioned how it needs mm -hmm. to bring different people uh, uh, together. So probably I'll ask you this question. How, how, how is the one health approach comes to play in this, in this situation? So now, when we talk about one health approach is when human health, veterinary health, and environment came together. Because over the years, all these departments have been working in silos, or should just say parallel lines. So now, they have had their successes, but then all of a sudden now, it's reached a point where now, diseases are jumping back, are going across. Um, degradation of the environment, or misuse of the environment, is opening cases where now new diseases are coming in, or old ones. <laughs> <laughs> and you cannot control it and things are happening. So now they have realized that now we have to now work as a complete one unit. So we can support each other and we work together in, in whatever. So now whenever there is a Rift Valley, Rift Valley fever outbreak and it's been de de detected by the vets mm -hmm. or the medics get a case, immediately they come together because in Kenya we have the Zoonotic One Health Unit. So now they will come together and together work on surveillance and alert systems and follow-up systems because where the human came from or where the animal king came from can tell each side where the disease might progress. Apart from that, now the environmental have to come in because Rift Valley season is temperamental to rainy season and other seasons. So now 
you come to them and ask them, this is the area is happening, where next is there a potential that we can go and block this thing and how within the environment can we balance the human to the environment, the animals, the environment and the human's environment so now there is no overlapping and this disease can die out. So it's become that complex and that enjoyable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually makes disease um, eradication and disease control faster and far much cheaper because you don't go through the full elongated thing. Yeah. So now when it comes to rabies, the dog lives in the house. The human live with the dog and then the dog lives around the cows and the goats and for pastoralist communities those cows and goats and the dog go manga mangaring in wildlife areas. Mm -hmm. In wildlife areas we have the big cats and wild dogs and when I mean wild dogs we talk away from the African wild dog the hyena who they interact with and this rabies can jump to them and then it causes a small cycle within wildlife though it, it doesn't sustain in wildlife and you know every wild animal down is a tourist dollar lost. Mm -hmm. And every wild cat and every wild dog down <laughs> means uh, less impalas, less gazelles are killed. And the more impalas and more gazelles are there, like this drought period, means that the vegetation um, has a heavier effort to keep them alive. And instead of there now, at the end of the drought period, there's still five bushes because the wild cats and wild but can is died and didn't eat, eat enough <laughs> antelopes. Mm. Now there are no bushes. Then the next thing, the antelopes are in your maize farm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, calling calling them. <laughs> so you see how all this <laughs> oh, <laughs> comes together to, yeah. in, in one big circle. Oh, so God. that is how the One Health, Ill, one health happens. Yeah? Mm. And now if the, rab the dog has rabies, it bites the livestock, the livestock dies, there goes earnings. Your milk cow is dead. Your goats, who you've been planning for Christmas to produce, you can sell Christmas meat, gone. If the husband is bitten and he's died and he was a main, whatever, yeah. breadwinner, what happens to that family financially and whatever? So you see, it's, it's really a fully integrated system that we have to actually work in one unit. Do yeah. you think, as you've said, this is the only way to eliminate such kind of diseases, especially those which are preventable? Yes, those are presentable and the ones that are zoonotically uh, transmitted, which means they jump from human to animals, yeah. whether livestock or wildlife, that is the only way we can work in one health. Because mm -hmm. if you do not sustain a, a, healthy a healthy environment, whether it be in the agricultural sector or the wildlife sector, which means animals have stress, when stress comes, those diseases pick up, and when those diseases pick up, they jump. Okay. When it so now, <laughs> as a human being, yeah. you have to know that these diseases affect you. So how do you on our side keep our health, protect ourselves, and then protect those animals that are the vectors in between mm. to stop these diseases bouncing? So yes, it does yeah. affect. Uh, I'm told we have limited time, but I wanted to ask you this, Dr. Ruben, as you're winding up here. How is this uh, One Health approach being received in the country, and what is it that you can do yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, to, to ensure that this is approached. So I can say for Kenya is that Kenya, in fact, in Africa is one of the really leading countries because when the One Health concept came up, they took it up. So in Kenya, we have what is called the zoonotic disease, but then now it's become bigger called the One Health Office. So now in that One Health Office is where the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Environment and Ministry of uh, Livestock have officers si sitting but then they work with, with various, within their own departments. Okay. So now that is there um, and we are, we are moving ahead. So I congratulate. <laughs> now it's now to see how that, and then not only that is that they have gone out and have made county governments open One Health offices okay. the very same way. Okay. So now that is set up and that is going there. So now, as I said, what you'd say is now, mostly as I say, it's mostly the funding on how to let these offices really run. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Zero to 30, Kenya is part of that pledge. Yes. 2030 is just around the corner. Kenya is <laughs> Where is the progress on that? Kenya is one of those, is, is part of them, and Kenya was one of the first African countries. There were a couple who had a national rabies elimination strategy. It was, it was finished in 2014, and it was launched by the then governor of Makweni County. Professor Kibidua Kibwana, the Kenyan, they have driven the first uh, steps towards the pilot program. But as you know, when they were scaling up, rabies came. So most of these programs had to 
mm. scale back because now uh, COVID was one hell. So now people do not understand that when it came to contact tracing and all these statistics, they had to bring both the vet and the human side together. So it has been a one health unit has been driving. So the program like rabies have slowed down, but right now county governments are picking them up again. Mm -hmm. And we hope now with the new county governments and with the drive for one and the vet and the veterinary and human sides, it will now pick up from where it is and move on. So now apart from that, when it comes to um, the One Health Office, Kenya has, in the One Health Office, had, does, has done more than rabies in their strategies. They have for diseases like Rift Valley Fever, they have like for brucellosis and antimicrobial resistance. So at national government, and this has trickled down to county level. So now as, as a country, we are there. It's just now what we need to help us carry <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to the final <laughs> yeah. <laughs> As a doctor, you're here, I can't let you go without telling, asking you this. What can me and someone who's watching at home do to help eliminate rabies? What you can do, especially the person who's at home, get your dog vaccinated. Every year, get your dog vaccinated. Go to your, your veterinarian and understand the health needs for your dog because that is most important. All I can say is rabies is a very large topic. <laughs> it, it is. We can't finish it in 30 minutes. I'm hoping I'll get you so that we can get to the nitty gritty of it. Thank you so much for making time. Mm -hmm. Here in Kass, we say Kongoi Missing. Thank you very much, Kongoi. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've heard from Dr. Kavosa Mudoga, who is the director from the Action for Protection of Animals Africa. The organization does a lot of things when it comes to animal welfare, but today she's been speaking to us about how we can protect the animals in communities. Vaccinate your dog is the last word that she said, and I hope you're going to take the initiative to learn more about this issue of rabies. My name is Tim Taikiri. This has been the conversation about conservation, and I'm hoping to see you on the next one. Have a blessed one. Bye. Hey.